open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Starting at verse 11. Okay, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 11. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Uh, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Uh, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Uh, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Okay, wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay. So what we're going to be looking at is something similar to what Pastor Christ has been preaching uh, Though I, I know he's addressed this passage in particular uh, in the past because he's preached through it as a series and then also just as it's come up, uh, well, it's, it's going to be coming up as well. Uh, so he'll bring it up somewhat uh, in the series that he's doing now with regard to separation and holiness. And so um, this is pretty much a keeping in, in theme with that series, uh, though this isn't his message necessarily. But um, we have here. Uh, mandate, and so that would be the first point in Ireland is, okay, the mandate for holiness. This is something that Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, uh, just to establish a context, he's writing to them, uh, well, he, uh, he's written to them previously to address issues that they have had uh, within their congregation, and among the many issues that they would have had is uh, they had an individual that was uh, committing fornication, he was having a moral relationship uh, with what would have been his father's wife. So the implication there is that it's not his mother. It would be, I guess, his stepmom. And so it, he even, Apostle Paul even said that this is not even named among the Gentiles, that they would do such a thing. Uh, and they were puffed up because rather than mourn or grieve or address the issue at hand, uh, they were saying, they basically acted as if, well, we're kinder than God or we're nicer than God, so we just kind of like let it go rather than just rebuke him sharply so that he would get right. Uh, and that was many of the, a number of many things that he had addressed with them. They had an issue with partiality. In other words, they, they, they looked to people and they looked at people that were used of God and then they exalted man rather than looking at the God of that man. And, and, and rather than worshiping God, they were worshiping, you know, Basically, in a sense, each other, and they were—they were—they were saying, "Well, I'm, I'm a, one person's of Paul, I'm another of, of Apollos, I'm a Cephas, another person saying, you know, I'm of Christ. You know, Christ is not divided, and so the thing is, if you actually really followed Christ, there would be a unity, and there would be division that there was among them. Uh, other things that they were dealing with the fact that they were taking the Lord's Supper unworthily, and in particular, the issue there was that they had sin in their life." while taking it. Uh, they were looking at it as, a, as it was a feast, but rather than being for what it really was, which was a memorial to the fact that Christ was broken for us to pay for our sin. Uh, he, now, mind you, he didn't stay dead. He rose again from the dead three days later. Uh, but the, that death that he, that he suffered, his body was broken, and then he poured out his blood, uh, his life's blood, to death uh, so that we would have our sins paid for and they were taking it as it was a, a light thing. Uh, some of the other issues that they were dealing with the fact was that they looked at spiritual gifts. They were ignorant regarding a number of them, and they were uh, 
I guess using them improperly, or they were having a they had a pursuit or desire to exalt themselves and, and I guess self promote. And rather than have God be the one get the preeminence, they were looking to be somebody that was uh, recognized or known for this gift or that gift, rather. And um, so improper use of spiritual gifts was another issue uh, that they had dealt with. Uh, another thing that he had dealt with in, in chapter 15 uh, regarding the resurrection was the fact that they had individuals that said, you know, there is no resurrection from the dead. And then he addressed, you know, that fallacy saying, you know, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then, uh, you know, we are of all men most miserable. You know, we don't have any hope. We don't even have hope in this life, <laughs> let alone for the next if there is no resurrection from the dead. Uh, so he addressed a number of these issues, and then they got right, uh, and he starts addressing the fact that when they actually went ahead and got right, uh, their response, I guess maybe it was a little bit overboard with regard to that gentleman that had uh, committed fornication with his mother-in-law, or not mother-in-law, but with his uh, stepmom. And so he was saying, lest that gentlemen become overcome with sorrow and Satan taken advantage, uh, it's, you can restore him because he has repented. In other words, the, the goal for the chastisement and the, the discipline from the church was so that this person would get right from you know right with God so that he could be restored to the fellowship because the truth is, uh, if he's got breath in him, uh, God still wants to use him. God still wants to do something with his life. God still has a plan for his life. And so the fact is, he, God wants to restore him, as he does with everybody else. You know, um, and he addresses that, and then he starts addressing a number of things. Uh, chapter 1, regarding in particular to the fact that uh, trials and difficulties that we would experience, God allows so that we would in turn, uh, the comfort that we would receive from God would be able to comfort others that find themselves in a similar position. So God allows a lot of times these difficult uh, things and circumstances in our life so that we would, one, first know God's comfort and then, two, use that and be used of God to be able to go ahead and be an encouragement and a blessing to somebody else that find themselves in the same position. That it would help point them to God and, and appropriate the grace of God in their life uh, to, to have that comfort and that peace that only He can give. And so now He's addressing a number of different things. And in particular... Uh, it seems that even though they have gotten right, they have kind of a standoffish uh, disposition towards Apostle Paul in how, in his writing, in particular chapters 4, 5, and 6, uh, even going into 7, uh, and then even further down if we read the whole, the whole Second Corinthians, that it seems as if, oh man, he's coming around again and he's just going to, you know, he's out to get us. It's almost as if, okay, you know, uh, he doesn't have anything good to say. What's he going to say now? You know, how's he going to deal with us now? Uh, and they have that approach and that attitude towards him, it seems like. So he's writing to them saying, you know, listen, uh, I love you guys. I wrote to you, and I, didn't, you know, I really didn't want to have to deal with this, but the fact is it needs to be dealt with because there was sin in your lives and in this church, and it needed to get right. I'm glad you guys got right, but the fact is, you know, I love you all. And... Uh, I am not your enemy if I point out sin, if I point out wrong. Uh, sin needs to be dealt with and wrong needs to be addressed. Because uh, the fact is, uh, they as believers and as well as we as believers uh, need to be in right standing with God. Now, Apostle Paul in particular was given uh, as a gift to not only this church, but also to, to, to the whole you know, church as a founding um, so that, uh, as, we're, 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 as we've read in Ephesians 4, that uh, he gave some apostles and prophets and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of, of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, so that they would be uh, matured and uh, basically developed so that God would use them for his plan, for his will, what, what he wants for them. Um, in that, he starts addressing something here that we see uh, that is beneficial to us with regard to this subject of 
holiness and separation. Uh, now, what a uh, pastor has been preaching here is that separation in this fact uh, is something that's needful, necessary, and crucial for us to be able to grow in God and to be able to have a fruitful life that God not only would be pleased with, but God could say, you know, when we stand before him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And mind you, though there seems to be a negative attitude and aspect towards separation, the fact is it's a very positive teaching. It's a very positive thing. Uh, because, um, one, we've been called to life, not to death. Okay? And separation uh, is, one, founded upon the character of God. We are called to be like him because we are not like him as we are. And so we're, wherever we're found, when God calls us, uh, in other words, when we receive Christ, whether that was as a child, uh, grown up in a Christian home, or whether that was as an adult, you know, somebody that had no knowledge of God whatsoever, lived wickedly, regardless of where you find yourself on that spectrum. The fact is, wherever you find yourself, whenever you come to know God, God calls you to be like Him and like like Christ, as unto His Son, and then He's predestined us to be conformed to His image, Christ's image. That is, and so where we find ourselves, regardless of where we are on that spectrum, we're always going to be. Uh, push, funneled, and encouraged to be like Jesus, and that is this that that requires that hey, my thinking changes so that my behavior changes, so that my speech changes, so that everything about me changes, and that is going to be a continual process until either I die, and that goes for all of us, or until we are taken home to be with Christ uh, until he come until he returns. Either one of the two. Uh, whichever one of the two comes first, and then you know we'll be we'll be in that moment in a twinkle of an eye transformed uh, to be like him. Okay, so where he's addressing now, um, go uh, start back at the chapter six, verse one. He uh, verse ending of chapter five, he addresses the fact that we are ambassadors for Christ. Is you know we've been committed to ministry of reconciliation. That is uh, that area of service where we seek to be the means or the channel. Well, not really a channel, but we seek, we seek to be that to have people to encourage people to, to push people to be reconciled to God. And then we've been committed to the word of reconciliation, which is which is the word of God, Bible. So in other words, God, people come to know God. Uh, it's primarily because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but He uses us, okay? And we are we are those that are representative uh, of Him, and then He uses obviously His Word, uh, but we, He can't remove from the equation the the person because that, that that's what God has committed unto us, and that that's a responsibility that He's entrusted uh, unto believers. And then jumping into chapter six, He says, "We then, as workers together with Him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain." Uh, and so now he starts pointing this out is the fact that grace of God had been committed unto you not only as an ambassador grace of God has been committed to you as a believer and beyond the fact that God when you receive Christ as your savior uh, puts unto you his Holy Spirit of promise and seals you to the day of redemption not only does he uh, change your direction he gives you new purpose for living he also gives you know eternal life we have a home in heaven that's promised we have an inheritance incorruptible undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for us and he gives a number of other great precious promises uh, that pertain not just to this life but life to come um, he he specifically now is is going to be dealing with the fact that regarding this life um, he doesn't want us to receive it in vain and here's the idea that there's to be profit and progress in our life as a believer, and that's only seen as if we make willful choices to say yes to God when He leads and to appropriate what He gives to us. Okay, so in other words, God gives gifts and He has gifts and He has things that are available to us, but it doesn't benefit us or do us any good if we don't. In other words, we don't take it uh, unto us. And then, and then He starts addressing. Uh, Here's how this is going to be looking. He says, For 
Uh, for he saith, I have heard thee in the time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Uh, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Uh, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approve ourselves as the ministers of God, and much patience in afflictions and necessities and distresses and stripes, and imprisonments and tumults and labors and watchings and fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. And then that's where he cries out basically, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged, and you're not straightening us, but are straightened in your own bowels and then he calls to them listen um, don't be unequally yoked and then remove yourselves separate yourselves and then he says having therefore these promises now the promises refer in particular to the immediate thing that he had said which was that God said that uh, if you come out from among them be separate and touch not the unclean, un unclean thing I will receive you and then I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, that's not actually dealing with salvation. Okay, that's post salvation. All right. God promises that when you come to Him, when you call out to Him, the Bible says that as many as received them, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. You know, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life and so a person when they receive Christ they're crying out to him because well you know like most everybody else is gonna be like I don't want to go to hell and the only payment that you have for the sin that you committed which carries with it a death sentence uh, and the only way to pay for that would be actually to die but you don't come back from where you die uh, once you die and to, to avoid that you know you have the gift of God available to you uh, and that is Christ that he died to pay for our sins. So he's a payment, he's a propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, but also that he rose again from the dead, so that not only did he make payment for that, which I owed, but he gives new life that I can experience now, and also for that is to come. Uh, and so I, I can not only have payment for my sin, in other words, I got forgiveness, uh, but I also have new life, eternal life, uh, given to him, or given, given by us. Or given to God by it, uh, given to us by God. Um, so um, that's that's a that's a that's that's a done deal. Whenever somebody receives Christ, that's what happens. But then not only does he, he do that, but he makes a promise: is that God has more for us beyond just uh, escaping the penalty of of hell, escaping the penalty uh, of final judgment, uh, which would eventually would be not only just from hell, but going into the lake of fire. So God has more for us beyond that. He doesn't want just for us to, okay, great, we've escaped, you know, judgment, and that's it. No, he's got, he's got numerous other plans, but that only comes about as if, as we yield ourselves to him. And so he makes promises here, and so we see first thing is our his mandate, and that is that uh, you know let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, while perfecting the holiness, uh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay, so cleanse ourselves from filthiness of uh, flesh and spirit. This is God's crying command to anyone that is. A name, the child of God. In other words, anybody that would trust Him, that has trusted Him, uh, this is what He desires for you: that you would clean yourself from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Now, why? Why is that? Like, what's what's the big deal? I mean, doesn't God know that? You know, I mean, the Bible even says that you know He remembereth that our frame, you know, we're but dust. Right? And if I'm mistaken, that's in Psalm 103. Uh, you know, as far as he tells us that, as far as the east is from the west, that he removes our sin from us. Uh, you know, 
cast into the deepest part of the sea. Uh, and so, you know, he remembers our frame that we're but dust. You know, so in other words, we're weak, we're prone to want to sin. So, you know, why does he call out to us, okay, hey, you need to cleanse yourself? Uh, mind you, he says specifically not just of the flesh, but of the spirit. Why is that such a big deal? Well, it's because sin brings about death. Okay, it's uh, an unfortunate thing that, uh, you know, the condition of the world that is in presently, but the fact is, uh, even what we would think is the most minor, insignificant uh, infraction or uh, indiscretion, as we would try to call it, but rather, you know, God calls it sin. Uh, the fact is, it's going to hurt somebody and it brings about death. Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, when Eve was tempted and she took of the fruit after she was deceived and then she gave of her husband that was with her, I mean, what was the big deal? I mean, she just took a bite of a fruit, right? Like, what? <laughs> Doesn't that seem kind of harsh? You know? Doesn't that seem kind of like, oh, man, that's, you know, God's this big meaning. Like, why do you have to do all this, you know, for that? Well, the, the truth is, it's what seems like, from our perspective, is something that's really insignificant. It's really like a major thing with God. And the thing is, we are not like Him. <laughs> I mean, that's a grand understatement of the, of, the, of, you know, of all time, basically. But the fact is, it's like, we are not like God. Uh, God's holy. Like, honestly, it's hard to even relate because the fact is, what do we know outside of what we, you know, what we read in Scripture? Uh, when God presented Himself to, uh, go to, go to Revelation, go to Revelation chapter one, go to Revelation chapter one. Start, I started just verse 1, but we're going to skip down a little bit. Uh, okay, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signal, uh, signified it by his angel unto his servant John, okay, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now this is John's introduction. This is the same John that if we were to read back in the Gospel of John that wrote that, okay, the same one who, uh, he had a brother named James, uh, who, were, they were called Boadrones, basically Sons of Thunder, and that they, uh, he in particular, as well as with his brother, as well as with Peter, stood on that mount uh, where Jesus transfigured himself while Jesus was physically still alive on this planet, showed himself in his full glory. Okay, uh, and who repeatedly calls himself within the book of John when he writes of himself the apostle or you know the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, so in other words, he saw himself as somebody that you know he was greatly loved by God. Okay? And of the twelve, he would have had one of the closest relationships to Jesus Christ, and that was out of, out of just the fact that he desired that. That's what he wanted, and you know. He wasn't any much different than any of the others. In other words, he was still a sinful man that needed God to save him, you know, to rescue him. Uh, we don't really know much of his education other than he was a fisherman, uh, whether he was an extremely educated person or, you know, rather uneducated, but he was a, he was a fisherman. He had a temper. He had a temper issue. We know that uh, because he wanted to go ahead and be one, you know, him and his, that's what they call Sons of Thunder. Uh, they, they, you know, they're willing to call down fire from heaven. Because uh, somebody, you know, they felt, okay, he's not with us, and and and, and, uh, and those kinds of things. Uh, and he was uh, he was one, he was actually the only one that died, I guess you could say, a natural death per se. Uh, all the other apostles uh, of the twelve were killed. You know, they were they were murdered, they were butchered for for Jesus. But he would have been the only one that actually lived long enough to be able to die a natural death. But nevertheless, okay, so he has a close relationship with God 
while on earth physically while Jesus was walking on this planet. And so, um, you know, this is something, okay, the angel's going to come and say uh, uh, to him what, what the things to come, the things that are going to come, uh, are going to be. Uh, skip down to verse 10. Uh, okay, and then I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyr and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto La Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Okay, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about paps with a golden girdle on his head, and his hairs were like, or were white like wool, and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet uh, like a defined brass, uh, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice uh, as the sound of many waters, in other words, it thundered, it roared, it had a very, like a boom to it. And then he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth uh, in his strength. Okay? So I was like, wow, okay, this is a pretty neat description. <laughs> Could you imagine turning around, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, okay, you see this? This is pretty, like, uh, awesome kind of thing to see. And then verse 17, and then when I saw him, okay, speaking of Jesus, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. All right? Now, mind you, this is the same person that he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. He leaned on Jesus' breast whenever they were at the Passover. Uh, he was at the Mount of Transfiguration. He's seen Christ prior to his dying, you know, being uh, exposing himself, revealing himself as who he was in his glory. Um, he was one of the only ones actually at the cross uh, that actually really didn't abandon, even though all fled. He was actually at the foot of the cross when Jesus was being crucified and then Christ said, you know, uh, you know, son, uh, you know, look unto thy mother and then mother look unto thy son. And so he committed his mom's care to him. Uh, and, you know, he, uh, <laughs> this is somebody that you would think, okay, hey, I've seen, you know, I've, I've accompanied with God. You know, I've walked with God. I have a close relationship with God. And here he sees God in flesh. Now, mind you, this, I know this is after, uh, and this is a number, way number of years already following that. But he's, already, he's had it. He's, he's maintained a close relationship with God. And here he sees God in his glorified state. Uh, he'd already seen him. I mean, Jesus presented himself and he said, you know, you know, receive you the Holy Ghost. And, you know, he's been used. Um, and here he is. Jesus presents himself and boom. He falls at his feet like as dead. Okay, so he's like a dead man in shock for seeing God for who he is. You know, it reminds me of, it reminds me of Isaiah's response when Isaiah cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone. You know, I'm unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. He sees God high and lifted up at his throne, uh, and his train filled the temple uh, when he presents himself after King Uzziah died. And then uh, the smoke filled the temple. You got the angels crying about holy, 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 uh, covering their, uh, you got the two wings covering their face. You got the two wings flying, covering their feet, uh, two wings as well. And that terrible sight. This also reminds me of another instance in where you have, now this is going a little bit further back, but you have where Israel is wandering in the wilderness and you uh, are come to Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai, at this point, God rests within the top of it, and you have this cloud and this smoke, and it seems like a fire and thunderings and lightning coming about, and it seems like, whoa, man, some great terrible storm. What's going on? If anybody would come even close, they would be thrust through with a dart. They would die. You know, there, it was, he was such holy. Uh, he was so holy, you couldn't even, couldn't even approach him. 
Uh, actually, at that time, only Moses was able to. And then the people cry out, like, whoa, Moses, you go before God and you talk to him and you deal with him, you know, unless we die. You know, what happens here if we see God, we're going to be killed. We're not going to survive this. Now, the funny thing is, is that God said to Moses, you know what, they've spoken rightly. In other words, they said what, what they've said is actually correct. They would die. You know, but the fact was, even, you know, what made Moses any different, besides the fact, okay, yeah, he was called uh, by God. But beyond that, I mean, he had a bad temper. He killed somebody, uh, you know. Um, he had a bad temper even so much so that he was in a, he, he, he committed sin to where he was not able to go into to the promised land himself, and he forfeited his own blessing that he had of God to be able to go ahead and, 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 and not only lead the people, but actually go in to the promised land himself. He couldn't even, he couldn't even walk in. Um, but the thing was, the difference was that he had a heart to say, look, I want to know God. I, I want to know God. And so God would make them separate themselves. And actually, he would actually, you know, you got to go wash yourself and then prepare yourself so that whenever you come present yourself before me, that you're ready to be able to, uh, to basically deal, to, to have interaction with God. And it's because of the nature of God. We'll go back to 2 Corinthians. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Okay, so the significance or the importance of the of this holiness command is because it's it's, it's predicated on the on the of the character of God. You know, God Himself is holy. That's who He is. You know, He can't He can't be anything else but what He is. We are not. You know, but not, but if we're going to be in that fellowship with Him, then we need to clean ourselves. We need to remove that filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Okay, not just the flesh, but of the spirit as well. Uh, John says it like this in First John. He says that uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. You know, if any man love the world, uh, love the Father is not in. For the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know. They're not of the Father. And you ask yourself, okay, how do I do this then? How do I clean myself? It seems like a pretty broad and vague command that we're supposed to clean ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Uh, and he wants us to come out from that which is unclean. So how do I do that? Now this presupposes, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This presupposes that we have a knowledge and an understanding of that which is clean and unclean. Okay? There's a presupposition here that, that we have an understanding, our basic foundation of that which is clean and unclean. Start in verse 1, but then we're going to skip around a little bit. It says, okay, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another uh, in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he is going to start elaborating on some facts with regard to God. And in Christ in particular, you know, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And this is regard specifically to the fact that there is supposed to be a unity. In other words, if we are walking in fellowship with God, then we would be walking in fellowship with other believers who are walking in fellowship with God. Okay, there's going to be a unity there. Christ is not divided, and it's not as if, uh, you know, he has teaching for here that is different from over there, but rather... If you're right with God, then you're going to be on the same page or on the same wavelength with believers that are right with God as well. Does that make sense? In other words, God, you know, we, uh, God has, God has a page that he's on. Uh, he has a wavelength, that, a frequency that he's on. And we need to match what that is. And so when we, uh, when we do, then not only will we be in fellowship with him, but we'll be in fellowship with others that are going to be on that same frequency, on that same wavelength. Uh, go to um, verse 17. Okay, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth 
walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God to the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to uh, unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Okay, but ye have not so learned Christ. And then the, the idea here of if is since so be uh, that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. So in other words, Christ is not like how you would basically learn, you know, what is natural, fleshly behavior. Uh, what he calls here, you know, as other Gentiles, you know, they give themselves over to lasciviousness to work on the cleanness with greediness. In other words, they, all they know, because all they can really know, uh, apart from the Holy Spirit of God, you know, is flesh living. You know, and if that's not tempered with any kind of instruction, the fact is, it's still just flesh living. It's all displeasing the God, and it's all wicked. And here he goes and starts naming off. Uh, well, okay. Verse 22, it says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Okay, there's nothing redeemable or good about that old man. And it says that be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And now he's going to start naming off and he spends basically a good part of the rest of chapter 4, chapter 5, and then going over into chapter 6, how this looks like, how this actually plays out, you know, an everyday practice. Okay, and here's some, here's some things that we see. Okay, we're for putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good and that he may have to give to him that needeth okay, then your speech. Uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that may minister grace unto the hearers. So it deals primarily not just with behaviors, but as far as a mindset, uh, attitudes of the heart. Um, wherefore put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Why would a per I mean, I know it seems kind of silly. It, it's maybe a hundred different reasons, or maybe even more than that, as far as, like, why would somebody lie? But what motivates people to lie? Why? I mean, isn't it easier just to de deal with the truth, to tell the truth? But you still have people that lie to you, right? And even so much so that you have some people that, <laughs> they would be, uh, I can't even remember the term, but it's almost as if they, it's, it's like, Every other word out of their mouth is a lie. They don't even realize they're so uh, chronic conditioned. Chronic pathological. Oh, pa yeah, that's what it is. Pathological. <laughs> that they, they. It's, it's as if they. It's like they don't know anything else. You know, that's. It's so common for them to be able to go ahead and lie. But I you know it seems kind of silly. Like, okay, well, we know better. We know right. But quite frankly, everybody has an attitude that says, you know, I want mine. I gotta get mine. We'll see some of that as far as. Here. But, the, but the fact is, is that if you know God, and if Jesus is your Savior, if you trust in Christ as your Savior, then He's the one that takes care of you. He's providing for you, you know. And it's you stepping out on faith, making that choice to say, I'm not going to live like that or say this thing or do like that. I'm going to be different. And the difference is because He's different, okay. And that is a showcase. It's a means to showcase who He is to people. Uh, not just me arbitrarily choosing to do that, but rather that's God's will and God's design. He wants to show who He is because He wants all men to come to know Him and to trust Him. Uh, that's His will. That's His desire. Uh, you know, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Okay, Not being a wrathful person. Somebody, is it even possible to be angry and not sin? I mean, obviously, He says here, it says, be angry and sin not. In other words, you don't have to give in to your urge. There is a such thing as righteous indignation, okay? I'll be honest with you. There's, this, there's things in this world that are so corrupt and so just criminal and wicked, it'd be kind of hard not to, <laughs> you know, to, to get angry at. You know, somebody abuses a child. Uh, somebody 
you know, willfully commits criminal act and, and, and purposefully harms somebody uh, that's innocent, that's not, you know, that's wicked. And it's kind of hard, to, you know, the, where you would, you know, the fact is they are a person for whom Christ died, and, but there needs to be justice that needs to be, you know, meted out. Uh, you, you, can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't just like, hey, well, oh, well, it's no big deal. The fact is it's like, okay, justice does need to be served. Uh, but you don't have to let the anger be something that consumes you. He actually addresses that further down in verse 31 when he talks, well, okay, yeah, verse 31, he talks about, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, okay, malice being that ill intent, that ill will, uh, that bitterness, holding that grudge, uh, that wrath and anger and clamor. Uh, the fact is it's not supposed to be something that consumes us. We're not supposed to respond like that and all the outworkings of that. That's not, Christ is not like that, you know? It says here actually, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And this now, mind you, this is dealing with believers and believers' interactions. But even God, you know, speaks of that we're supposed to love our neighbors, uh, and also that you know, love our enemies. <laughs> that's really kind of a hard one, you know, especially if you have somebody that's really intending ill will. Uh, you know, he, he speaks of it in Romans uh, that we're, you know, um, you don't respond to evil with evil, but rather you do it with good. You don't respond to cursing with cursing, but rather you respond to it with blessing. That's not setting yourself up or making yourself out to be a, a victim or uh, a doormat, mind you, because God is just and God is right. And God says that vengeance is his, that he will repay. So the, the, ultimately the fact is that I'm supposed to commit myself unto him uh, and, and let him be the one that judges uh, that makes where he carries out uh, you know justice I don't take it into my hands unless it's a legal matter that he already because he's already he's he's given with regard to our governance uh, our governing ourselves as far as um, you know corporal punishment and those kinds of things even death penalty you see that from Genesis 9 so if it's a criminal matter then it becomes a Legal issue, obviously, yes, but the fact is, as far as within our heart, it's like, hey, we don't have, because that's going to consume us, and that's going to destroy us. Uh, another thing, as far as, uh, you know, neither give place to the devil. In other words, don't give the devil, you know, a foothold to where he can get into your life. And any of these areas will allow that. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Wow, this is a really tough one, also. For some folks, you have the temptation to want to say, "Hey, look, you know what's a little, you know, taken from from the boss here or there, or you know, eating up the clock or, or those kinds of things." Uh, the fact is, you know, I need to trust God to provide for me, uh, and what you know, what I don't have, I pray. You know, I mean, obviously, it's not like <laughs> you get to sit around and be a lazy bum, you know, because He calls us to work. He's, he's commanded us to work, you know. Uh, if man doesn't work, he, neither should he eat. Uh, but the fact is, I, I need to seek out to trust God uh, uh, for, for my provision. And he says here that rather than being a thief, rather than taking that, uh, which doesn't belong to me, I'm not only supposed to provide for myself, but I should have enough forethought and uh, foresight to be able to go ahead and have surplus to be able to give to those that would have need. You know, so rather than being uh, a source of loss, and I could be a, a you know a great source of benefit and profit to not just whoever, uh, but also you know to be a source of blessing to others because that's the truth is that's how God is, that's how that's what He's like, you know. Um, the Bible says of Him that He daily loadeth us with benefits. Okay, does He have to do that? No, I mean that's. <laughs> If he gave us what we deserve, the fact is we wouldn't be here. We'd be, you know, burning in hell, waiting, you know, to be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, but the fact is, he does it. He daily loads. He he raises upon the just and the unjust. You know, God's good. <laughs> That's all I can say. You know, and I'm not just saying that because okay, if, yeah, I've been spared judgment. But the fact is, 
beyond that, I mean, he's good. He gives. That's what he does. That's who he is. That's what he. That's how he expresses himself. You know, because he, he, he gives. He loves. And then uh, you know, our speech. Let no corrupt creation proceed. This is mind you. This is just a small sampling of how he calls for us to separate ourselves and live. Uh, how he called that. You know, um, cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit so that we would perfect holiness in the fear of God. In other words, that, that, that distinctness, that uniqueness uh, of, of, of how we live in practice, this is just a small sampling. We can go to uh, Galatians uh, and Colossians and the Philippians as well and see other commands in which he gives and then go all throughout the New Testament. Flee uh, fornication is another one that he also, he didn't mention it here. That's, well, he actually did, but... Uh, you know, that it's not supposed to be once named among you. Um, we didn't read that yet, but he does, he does, um, we'll go to <coughs> ch chapter 5, verse, what we're reading there. It says, okay, but be, be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and given us, uh, given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Uh, here's the reason why that's not supposed to be something that should be found in us, because it's not. It's, it's not the idea of becoming is. In other words, it's not appropriate or fitting for a saint to be, you know, unclean, uh, fornicating, uh, coveting. Uh, that's that doesn't that just that doesn't jive, you know. Um, I don't think we've had this in a while now. Well, okay. You've, um, I'm not familiar with this man other than just his name has popped up and I've seen a few articles, but uh, there's a guy named Jesse Duplantis. I guess he's some kind of televangelist. Uh, I don't, I, honestly, I really don't know anything other than just there was an article that was put out a few weeks ago that he was saying that he needed, I think it was like $56 million so he can buy himself like a new jet so he can go flying around, you know, to, to be preaching and those kinds of things, right? But he already has. <laughs> he already has one. Yeah, you know? I guess he wants an upgrade uh, for his lifestyle. And you got other guys that do that kind of stuff. And then you could probably go down, uh, what I was about to say was, we, we haven't had, like, uh, to my knowledge, any kind of recent incident locally. But then again, I don't, this, I don't, I don't really, like, spy out this kind of stuff, but, like, as far as, you got the, whatever, the perverted preachers, the guys that go around that they are, quote unquote, the man of God and, and that kind of stuff, and they're preaching and, that, and then they're, you know, with prostitutes. They're married with kids or something like that, but then they're going around with prostitutes or they're going around, you know, getting underage girls and that kind of stuff. And you're like, well, what's wrong with it? You know, it's like, <laughs> that's wicked. It's like, that doesn't, you know what I'm saying? That doesn't jive. That's just okay. You're 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 somebody that's supposed to be representing God, you know. Now we know that there's guys out there that are wolves or sheep clothing that are trying to fleece the flock. That they're trying to get people uh, that are actually genuinely uh, wanting to know God uh, and, and and take advantage of them and that kind of thing. So you always have to be on guard for that. Uh, but the fact is that doesn't jive. That's not that's not God. God's never called that. He doesn't approve of that. You know. He, Clearly, any cursory reading of the Word of God, you see that uh, he doesn't, you know, if you want a relationship, you know, you cry out to God and he'll bring you a wife and then you, you know, you two will be one flesh. You know, uh, marriage is honorable and all and the bed undefiled, but hormoners and adulterers, God will judge. Uh, that's, that's what he has to say about that. Uh, you know, the, the thieves, you know, that's, that's, a, that's wicked as well. That's, you can go down the line as far as any of these guys that are out there promoting themselves as being, you know, that's not becoming or that's not fitting or appropriate. You know, that what that does is that makes people that maybe were on the fringe of wanting to know God be like, uh, if, that, if that's what God is like, man, I don't want anything to do with that. That's why you got a lot of guys that are like, uh, well, to be honest with you, a lot of a lot of folks that are involved in like, and not always, but like a, a, a large number. I can't even really, I can't really put a percentage, but I know a first hand 
talking with people that are in homosexual lifestyle. A lot of them are that way because they were abused as kids, and a lot of times they have, as well as atheist people, uh, because they've had some bad experience with somebody that was representing God to them. You know, in other words, they, they had, okay, this person was religious, so if God is like that, you know, and he does bad stuff, or he does, and he's hurt me, I don't want anything to do with him, you know? And, <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you, you know, it's the grace of God you need to, as far as to be able to, to present to somebody. But the fact is, your clean living, your distinct living, brings authenticity to the message, and it, ha it carries with it a weight and authority that they really can't argue with. In other words, it's not, again, it's not about us either, it's about Christ, because we're representing Christ. Uh, but the fact is, you can't have, you know, this stuff that's wicked, which deep down we know it's wicked. Uh, and, and then, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm proclaiming God, or I'm trying to represent God. That's, that sends a mixed signal. And so God, God's called us to be ambassadors, that he's called us to walk uh, a certain way, and it's because of what he has done. And that is that if we've received him as our savior, he's put his spirit in us, and we are by default now his children and representatives of him. Uh, and so we, we're, we're called to that, and we're supposed to, we're supposed to represent him accurately. And that, that's what the separation of holiness is really about. It's about not only keeping clear so that we would have that unbroken, unhindered, unobstructed uh, fellowship relationship as far as where he can guide, he can lead, he can you know, direct in my life specifically, but also so that he works in a way where his, his image isn't like twisted or, or tarnished as far as um, God is who he is and he's going to make himself known. You know? But it'd be a shame if if we miss out on the opportunity as far as to make him known as who he is in our life. Uh, because we want to say, well, I want to do this, or I want to do that, and not yield ourselves and not cleanse ourselves of that filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Okay, so God has called us, he's given a mandate, and then also the means, and that is through the grace of God, by faith, uh, in reliance of his Holy Spirit, yielding to him, and the method is uh, obedience or yielding to what he commands. When he's given commands here, and if we would obey them, and then that's what we see activated in our life, uh, that difference and that change. And that's a daily choice that we need to make as far as to go ahead and live like this and make these choices so that uh, we can, regardless of whether we have five years or 50 years to live, uh, to be able to stand before God, to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Okay. So uh, let's let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Lord, I pray now that you'd help me and help us, Lord, uh, to be faithful to you and, Lord, to uh, embrace uh, holiness and separation, Lord, and not view it as something that is bad, uh, but rather that it's good. And that, Lord, we would have that heart that says, uh, like Moses, that we, we want to draw an eye to you, Lord. And though it is a fearful thing uh, to stand before you, Lord, uh, you said in your word that perfect love casts out fear, and so that we would have that in our hearts. I pray, Lord, if uh, there's anybody here that's a new you Savior, that uh, they would uh, call to you, uh, and uh, they would come to trust you this morning. Uh, praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.